Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 36 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. How and where did the colonies fit within the British Empire? The answer to this question would vary depending on whether we asked a British imperial official or colonist. Many imperial officials believed that the colonies and the colonists stood subordinate to the British Isles and the Empire. After all, they reasoned, England had established colonies in part to help increase the wealth of England. The colonists, on the other hand, had a different view. They believed that the colonies and their inhabitants stood as the equals to England and its people. They had no problem helping Mother England increase its wealth as long as the colonists could do what they needed to do to increase their wealth, such as trade for slaves. Abigail Swingin, author of Competing Visions of Empire, Labor, Slavery, and the Origins of the British Atlantic Empire, joins us to explore, well, the competing visions of empire that both the colonists and imperial officials had between the 17th and early 18th centuries. During our conversation, Abby helps us brush up on our English history so we can better understand why England established colonies in North America and the Caribbean the types of people who settled in the British Caribbean and North American colonies and how they lived, and how both the colonists and British imperial officers, such as the king, came to hold competing visions of empire and what those competing visions were. But before we get to our conversation with Abby, I wonder, have you been meaning to visit BenFranklinsWorld.com so you can sign up for the Franklin Gazette and receive the show notes for each episode in your inbox? Or so you can get the link to join Poor Richard's Club, the Facebook community for Ben Franklin's World listeners. But every time I ask you, you are out and about and away from your computer, and then by the time you get back to your computer, you've forgotten. I know I have this tendency. I know I have a tendency to ask questions and ask people to do things at the most inopportune time. If you've ever gone out to dinner with me, you'll know that as soon as you put food in your mouth, I'm bound to ask you a question. Today I have good news. I have found a convenient way for you to sign up for the Franklin Gazette while you are on the go. All you need to do is take out your cell or smartphone and text BF World to 33444. That's two threes, three fours. By texting BF World to 33444, you can officially join the Ben Franklin's World community and you will also receive a welcome bonus. I finally took your advice and created a list of my favorite early American history books, which you will receive when you text BF World to 33444 or visit BenFranklinsWorld.com and sign up for the Franklin Gazette. All right, let's get to our interview with Abby Swingin. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Abigail Swingin is an assistant professor of Atlantic history and early modern British history at Texas Tech University. Her research interests include the consequences of England's financial revolution and the development of the British transatlantic empire. Abby has just published her first book, Competing Visions of Empire, Labor, Slavery, and the Origins of the British Atlantic Empire. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Abby. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Congratulations on the publication of your first book. That's a real fantastic achievement. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like I've achieved something. Well, your book was great, and I'm really excited for us to be able to talk about it today. Let's begin by talking about your research interests. I know it's not uncommon for early American historians to study aspects of European history, because knowing what is going on in England, France, Spain, or the Netherlands helps us to better understand what is going on in their colonies. 
But your research interests seem to be primarily in English history. So would you tell us about what aspects of history you study? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I do consider myself first and foremost to be um, a historian of early modern English history, sometimes British history, but mostly English history. Um, And one of the reasons why I studied what I studied in this first book that we're going to be talking about in terms of the origins of the of the English Empire is that um, a lot of historians of early modern England don't take these things seriously. They don't take the foundation of colonies in places like the Caribbean and North America in the 17th century super seriously. They don't sort of, they're not on the radar in terms of political history or or really in terms of any history at all, except possibly economic history. And so that's one of the challenges that I have as an English historian is to try to encourage other English historians to to take that history seriously. And so that's how, in a way, I got interested as a historian of England is sort of, okay, well, why why don't people who study this period of English history seem to take imperial developments all that seriously. Since we have you on the line, this seems like a great opportunity to ask what the difference between English and British history is. Sure. I mean, in some ways, it's merely a semantic difference that explains the union of England and Scotland. Technically, England and Scotland are are separate kingdoms for most of the uh, certainly for the medieval period and most of the early modern period until the year 1707 when England and Scotland form a union. Uh, the, uh, the English Parliament passes the Act of Union in 1707. The Scottish Parliament assents to that, dissolves itself, and then Scottish members uh, sort of be- become absorbed into the Westminster Parliament. And that's when we get the technical creation of the Kingdom of Great Britain. And so technically, when you speak of the British state or the British government, usually that refers to post-1707. Um, and so, so, so that, that's the sort of semantic distinction that scholars tend to make. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Now let's transition into your book. Competing Visions of Empire opens with a question. Why did England establish and maintain an empire in the Americas during the 17th and 18th centuries? To me, it seems like to get to the answer of this question, we should start with the question of when did England start establishing colonies and why? Yeah, that's absolutely the the place to start. Um, England, as I'm sure many of your listeners will know, was relatively late to the transatlantic imperial game, really not getting involved in any serious colonial or transatlantic pursuits until the late 16th and early 17th century, so a good 100 plus years after, say, Spain and Portugal have established significant colonies in the New World. There's a variety of reasons why the English want to get involved. In part, it's to you know, find and exploit natural resources just like the Spanish have done. In part, it's jealousy of Iberia's wealth and strategic advantage in the New World from, you know, those silver mines in places like Mexico and, and Peru. There's a element of, you know, anti-Catholicism that goes along with that sort of that jealousy of the Spanish is often tinged with some anti-Catholic prejudice. And the other reason why, and this is one of the things that I focus on, is that colonies began to be understood as places where so-called surplus people could be could be sent away from England to ease England of its overabundant population and possibly, you know, again, exploit economic resources for the improvement of the realm overall. Let's discuss this overcrowding situation because many in 17th century England believe that the nation suffered from an overcrowding problem. What is the reality of that? Did England really have too many people living on its island? Well, it seems that population definitely increased quite substantially in the 16th and 17th century. So it's not surprising that contemporaries would have noticed an increase of population. Historical demographers have estimated that in the middle of the 16th century, about 1540, 1550 or so, England had a population just short of 3 million people 
And 100 years later, in the 1640s, England had a population of just over 5 million. So that's a pretty substantial increase in a 100-year period. And so, again, it's not surprising that contemporaries would have noticed this. And populations, particularly in cities and towns, were growing quite substantially at this time, particularly London, which grew just in, at astronomical rates compared to earlier time periods. So again, people would notice this. Now, whether or not there actually were, quote unquote, too many people is, of course, you know, that was the, the subject of, of what the contemporaries were, were debating. It seemed, again, like there were more, more people and it seemed like there were more uh, of the wrong sorts of people, or at least the, the kinds of people that could cause problems for society, such as unemployed people, you know, vagrants, as they were called. And other historians have studied this phenomenon or this sort of contemporary perception of too many people and have come down to the conclusion that that although population was certainly increasing and uh, demographics were changing, that, you know, what was going on was that the, there were these broader social and economic transformations taking place that seem to create, again, these surplus populations of unemployed people. For example, you know, we, we all, I don't know, those of us who read things like Sir Thomas More's Utopia learn about enclosures and things like that as, you know, that throw people off land in the late medieval and early modern period. Well, that's certainly a possible scenario there where all of a sudden, where at one point you had had dozens of people working on a farm, all of a sudden, you know, over the course of a, of a few decades or so, instead of tilling that land, you have pasture land for sheep, and therefore you only need a few people to work it rather than the dozens that had been there before. So it's entirely possible that with all of these agricultural changes and improvements, certain segments of the population did in fact increase. So again, it's not surprising that contemporaries might have, might have noticed this. It seems that people losing their jobs on the farms would gravitate towards cities, increasing the populations there. But what caused the overall population increase of England? A variety of things. This is actually not unique to England in the 16th and early 17th century. It seems to have been a phenomenon, at least in Western Europe, during this time period. In large part, it has to do with... Um, what, what any sort of increase in population has to do with, and that's better nutrition. There's more food available, and so that, you know, improves nutrition overall. That improves the likelihood of uh, babies, infants surviving to childhood, and therefore children surviving to adulthood. It seems to be something as, as simple as that, that there was just more, a, a greater food supply overall uh, that contributes to this, and, and combined with um, declining uh, mortality rates, um, although that's more debatable. Historians have hotly debated, or historians of medicine in particular, have debated whether or not death rates actually go down in the 16th century. But the fact of the matter is uh, life, in, life expectancy overall goes up slightly and birth rates go up slightly as well. As you mentioned, the perceived problem of overcrowding convinced many in England to start sending various sorts of the population to North America. Would you tell us about the men and women who became indentured servants? Do they have a common background, and did they leave England voluntarily, or did the government make them leave? Well, in the first instance, uh, sort of a combination of factors. Most indentured servants in uh, the first half of the, well, actually all over the, the, the whole 17th century, would have been male and would have been probably in their late teens, early to mid 20s. There were some women, but it was going to mostly be a male population that is leaving. And they are mostly leaving voluntarily. That is, they tended to be men who were perhaps farm laborers who, who did find themselves out of work or other kinds of, you know, men with perhaps some skills who were moving around anyway. We tend to think of, you know, medieval Europe, early modern Europe as a relatively stationary society. People are, are born in, in a village and they stay in that village until they die. Well, that really wasn't the case, especially in the 16th and 17th century. It's a highly mobile England was a highly mobile society. And so, again, people are, are moving from countryside to, to towns, villages to cities. 
And a lot of historians of migration patterns and demographic change in England have suggested that those who uh, voluntarily sign up to become indentured servants, it's sort of a natural progression for those for those folks in a way. Um, you know, they, they move to London and then they learn of another opportunity and they, they get on a boat and, you know, that, that transatlantic voyage, however much more, you know, perhaps money and, and effort it required was really just a natural extension of this mobile society. Now that said, uh, you know, as I point out, most of this migration is voluntary. There's certain segments of the population, though, that are not going voluntarily to the colonies. Very early on, say, in in Virginia, for example, it becomes both Virginia company policy and the and the policy of the, the English government to try to round up orphans off the streets of London, and several hundred children get sent, obviously against their wills, to to Virginia in the 1620s. There are other involuntary servants uh, who are sort of religious or political troublemakers, war prisoners sometimes. But by and large, these are people who have voluntarily entered into a contract or whose parents have voluntarily entered them into a contract. What sorts of jobs would they be expected to undertake as indentured servants in the colonies? All sorts of things. I mean, primarily, again, if they're going to places like the Chesapeake or later on the Caribbean colonies, they're primarily going to be engaging in some form of agricultural labor, either out in the fields or working in some sort of, you know, auxiliary way on a plantation or a farm. Again, if they had a particular skill, maybe utilizing that skill. But but these are sort of broadly unskilled, unspecialized, you know, agricultural laborers by and large. Convicts comprised another group of people that English men and women considered sending to the colonies. Abby, did the English government really send convicts to settle and labor in North America? And if so, what types of crimes did these convicts commit? The English government absolutely sent convicts to the North American and eventually the Caribbean colonies as well. Um, I already mentioned the uh, possibility of a political or religious, you know, prisoner basically being sent away, war prisoners as well, prisoners who were captured, especially in the uh, wars that followed the English Civil War when the uh, English army was conquering or trying to occupy and conquer Ireland and Scotland. A number of war prisoners from both Ireland and Scotland are sent away to the colonies. The other thing is that when someone was sentenced to go to the colonies as their, you know, as their punishment, basically, that meant they were sentenced to what was called transportation. And transportation actually becomes a pardon that judges would grant certain prisoners, certain convicts from for certain non-capital crimes that might have otherwise carried a death sentence in England. So, for example, theft. If you were convicted of, of stealing something from somebody else, rather than be, uh, you know, hanged for your crime, you might, if you were maybe lucky, get sentenced to transportation to the colonies. And, and some historians of criminal justice in England have determined that over the course of the 17th century, more and more judges became willing or more willing to sentence convicts to transportation to the colonies rather than give them a death sentence for, again, these these sort of particularly non-capital kinds of crimes. Did the colonists actually worry about convicts settling and working among them? Absolutely, especially over time. By the second half of the 17th century, there are numerous letters from colonial governors and officials going to London saying, hey, please don't send any more convicts. We're good. These people do not have good reputations. You know, we don't want to have dangerous criminals amongst us, even though, you know, it was debatable how dangerous some of these people actually were. Again, it's all about perceptions. In fact, in the 1670s, both Virginia and Maryland, their colonial assemblies passed laws outlawing the importation of convicts as 
laborers, basically, um, which the English government promptly ignores. They don't really abide by <laughs> that, that kind of colonial legislation. Um, but there's definitely concern in the colonies about, you know, having too many criminals in their, in their labor forces. In competing visions of empire, Abby focuses on the development of Barbados, Jamaica, and the Leeward Islands. Abby, what was life like for colonists in the Caribbean? What sorts of work did they engage in, and what sorts of cash crops did they grow? Well, as many um, scholars of Caribbean, colonial Caribbean society have uh, unearthed for us, life was pretty difficult for just about anybody in the Caribbean colonies in the 17th and 18th century. Colonizing these places was, was difficult, um, hard, hard work. In part, there was not only the difficulty of the agricultural work, which I'll get into in a moment, but just the climate was so different, different kinds of diseases were prevalent, and so health was was pretty hard, hard thing to come by. And so people were, you know, were very, were unhealthy, and it was just a, it was a difficult, difficult climate for, for survival. In terms of the kinds of work that people did in the Caribbean colonies, particularly servants and then eventually enslaved Africans. Again, we're talking mostly agricultural work and eventually the main cash crop that that is uh, grown in these colonies of Barbados, the Leeward Islands, and Jamaica is is sugarcane. They experiment with other so-called cash crops, you know, which are crops that are primarily, that sort of dominate a particular agricultural economy of a given region. Uh, in Barbados, for example, they, they try tobacco because they had had luck with tobacco in Virginia. It doesn't grow so well in Barbados. They tried indigo. They tried cotton. And eventually they tried sugarcane, and it just grew incredibly well in the climate there. And so that's what they that's what they decided on. And again, the the kind of labor that growing sugarcane entails is intensive. It's very hard work. Sugarcane, unlike say tobacco, requires quite a lot of attention. Needs to be weeded. Um, needs to get the vermin out of the out of the fields. Um, rats are a continual problem. And then harvesting has to be done with sort of clockwork precision because once you cut the sugar cane, you only have a certain number of hours that you can get the juice out of the cane. And if you wait too long, then you may, you may lose your entire crop. So it's incredibly labor intensive, difficult, backbreaking labor that these people are doing on sugar cane plantations. The hot tropical climate of the Caribbean, which in some ways was mimicked in the southern colonies of mainland North America, plus the labor intensive work of sugarcane, really caused the colonists to look for a different labor source. And that labor source that they turned to was slavery. So, Abby, when and why did the colonists in the Caribbean and mainland North America turn to slavery as a labor source? Well, it happens first and foremost, as I'm sure many of your listeners know, in Barbados. One of the reasons why this happens, and one of the things that I argue in the book, is that there's actually a uh, downturn in voluntary migration to English colonies from England starting in the middle decades of the 17th century. And so fewer and fewer people are indenturing themselves, for example, going voluntarily as indentured servants to the colonies, and not just to the Caribbean colonies, but to the North American colonies as well. And so that also contributes to a need on the ground in the colonies to search for different kinds of of labor. And as you say, in uh, you know, they turn in the first instance or in the, the most notorious instance to using enslaved Africans. And again, it happens first and foremost in Barbados during the 1640s and 1650s. Um, mostly the English planters there are getting slaves from other European traders, particularly the Dutch and the Portuguese. The English are not uh, heavily involved in the transatlantic slave trade during the 1640s and 1650s, but that is, that's where they, you know, get their access, in other words. And 
For a variety of reasons, slavery just takes off. It becomes the coerced labor source of choice in Barbados. Again, in part because there are fewer servants coming, but it also has to do with the fact that European slave traders are, are successfully bringing enslaved Africans to the Barbados market. And so that, that plays a, a large role as well. As England expanded its colonial holdings, competing visions of empire emerged between the Stuart government and in the colonists. Abby argues that these competing visions revolved around ideas about how the slave trade and empire should be managed. Abby, it seems like we need to understand the role of the Royal African Company in the story of competing ideas. Would you tell us what the Royal African Company was and what role it played in the Stuart Monarchs colonial policy? And perhaps maybe you could give us a refresher on who the Stuart Monarchs are. Sure. In 1660, the monarchy is restored after a period of an 11-year Republican experiment. Those, I'm sure your listeners may recall, in 1649, the English king, Charles I, was executed. Uh, the, the monarchy was abolished, and England embarked on, again, this so-called Republican experiment under the leadership of men like Oliver Cromwell in the 1650s. Well, after those Republican experiments were deemed unsuccessful for a variety of reasons, in 1660, King Charles II, Charles I's eldest son, gets invited back to England, and the monarchy is restored. And so he is the third of the Stuart monarchs, and it's his it's his uh, regime or government, and that of his brother James II that is the focus of many of the chapters in my book. Um, and so a lot of the imperial policies coming out of London reflect those of the Stuart monarchy, the late. Stuart monarchy. And one of those elements was the Royal African Company. The Royal African Company was founded by a royal charter issued by Charles II uh, that granted the company a, an exclusive monopoly on all trade to and from West Africa, um, to and from England and to and from the English colonies. And most, the most important of the trades that, uh, the Royal African Company had a monopoly on, of course, is the transatlantic slave trade. And one of the things that I really focus on in the book and that I argue is that the Royal African Company, uh, is of prime importance in the development of, uh, not only England's imperial policies and the imperial visions or ideals of the Stuart monarchs, but that the Royal African Company is of central importance in developing, you know, a a transatlantic slave trade and the, the promotion of slavery in the colonies as an element of English imperialism. Many historians of English imperialism, if they take it seriously at all, have not really looked at the important role that the African company played. And what I see happening in terms of what the Royal African Company does is because of its monopoly, which required basically that all planters in the colonies buy their enslaved Africans from company agents in the colonies, through that monopoly, planters, other colonists in places like Barbados and Jamaica are directly confronting imperial Power. They're directly confronting the uh, the English imperial state, if you will. And and the way I I phrase it in the book is that the Royal African Company becomes the commercial arm of the English government in in these Caribbean colonies. Um, and so that's that's why the Royal African Company is so important because this is how. Uh, again, the, the planters in particular, some, some merchants as well in the colonies are going to be directly confronting, negotiating with, or otherwise interacting with state authority, state power in the colonies. Slaveholders in the colonies really seem to dislike the Royal African Company. Abby, would you tell us why they disliked the company and why they really wanted a free trade in slaves? Sure. I mean, the main reason why most colonists in the English Caribbean colonies 
dislike the Royal African Company was because of the monopoly that it held on the slave trade. And so planters were resentful because, in theory, they were forced to purchase slaves from a monopoly corporation, which they argued limited the number of slaves on the market because it limited the number of merchants involved Merchants who were not, who did not belong to the Royal African Company, who did not own shares, for example, were equally resentful. And there were other constituencies in the colonies as well who were resentful uh, of the Royal African Company and its power. And the most significant uh, constituency of non-planters were privateers or you know, legal pirates, basically, who were, many of whom were based in Jamaica in particular, and they were distrustful and resentful of the Royal African Company because one of the things that the African Company tries to do is not only sell slaves to English planters, but they also try to sell uh, and profit from selling slaves to Spanish merchants. Now, how does this work? Well, basically, the Spanish were not directly involved in the slave trade themselves, unlike the the Portuguese, the English, the Dutch, and later the French. They do not establish trading forts or anything on the West African coast, and so the Spanish rely heavily and exclusively on other Europeans to, uh, you know, acquire their their slaves. And so the Royal African Company, like other European corporations and merchants, are, is aware of this and wants to try to profit from this. So how does this make privateers jealous? Well, essentially, privateers, English privateers, are notorious because their main target in the Caribbean um, was the Spanish. They always went for Spanish ships and ports because, again, the Spanish were the wealthiest Europeans in the region, often had plates, often had bullion often had other forms of wealth on their ships that could be easily stolen. And so the fact that the Royal African Company and therefore the Stuart monarchy to a certain extent wants to maintain peaceful relations with Spain, this is going to upset the privateers. So there's a variety of constituents who are, you know, again, resentful or jealous of the African Company. And it's not just planters, as we might expect. By the 1690s, debates over the government's right to control the slave trade through the Royal African Company seems to signal that the English have accepted slavery as a key element of their empire. Abby, would you tell us how and why the English government, as well as its populace, viewed slavery as an important to the financial wealth and growth of their nation? Sure. Well, what happens in the wake of the Glorious Revolution of 1688-89, which, is, which results in the removal of the Stuart monarchy, or at least James II, from power in England, um, is that the Royal African Company is no longer uh, at the center of imperial affairs, and it no longer has its monopoly. Um, James II had been its governor, had been its strongest most powerful advocate, and so when he's gone, the African company is kind of at loose ends in a way, and it understands that if it's going to maintain its monopoly, it has to get approval from Parliament rather than just a charter from the king, and this you know, has to do with how English constitutional politics change in the late 17th century. But what that does, what the effective removal of the African company's monopoly does is that it triggers a debate in Parliament and in some of the popular press about how the slave trade should be managed. The African company petitions and lobbies Parliament to try to get its monopoly officially reinstated, and this sort of encourages its traditional enemies, again, independent merchants, colonial planters, others with colonial interests to keep the slave trade open. Because effectively, by 1688-89, the slave trade or England's involvement in the slave trade is, is essentially an open one. And so there are these debates that take place throughout the 1690s and early 1700s 
over, you know, how the slave trade should be managed. Should it be a monopoly? Should it instead be a regulated company where merchants join, but they are not excluded from joining? That, you know, they, they're, they're free to join whenever they, whenever they would like. Should it be a truly free and open trade with anybody participating who can, who can afford to? And I think what these debates indicate is, is not only these, you know, competing ideas of how the slave trade should be managed, but really it, it indicated the, uh, the centrality of slavery and the slave trade to English imperialism and it, it illustrated its importance to the, uh, to the wider population as well as to the English government. You know, again, dozens and eventually hundreds of pamphlets get, get published um, that, that are taking a stand on, on the slave trade by the turn of the 18th century, something that England was hardly involved with 40 years previously. And so to me, again, that indicates that there's a broad awareness of not only slavery in the colonies, but that, you know, these colonies provide sort of an economic, uh, I don't know, service, if you will, to the English state and to English society. Um, they, they provide wealth. They provide colonial produce. You know, they provide these agricultural goods. And in order to sustain that, figuring out how best to regulate the slave trade is, is crucial. And so um, it, it comes about through these, these very public and in some ways surprising debates because they're taking place relatively early on in this imperial process, basically. These debates also seem to demonstrate that both the government and the English citizenry viewed slave-reliant colonies as integral parts of the empire. Could you tell us how the English state and citizenry looked upon colonies like New England or in the Mid-Atlantic region that were not as reliant upon slavery? Were they also viewed as integral parts of the empire? That's a really interesting question. Um, in some ways, I mean, it's not surprising. Those other colonies where there are not a uh, large number of, of slaves, they aren't really part of the debate. And so you're not going to see in in these, say, pamphlets or, or news sheets or anything that, that are talking about the slave trade, you're not going to see much about, say, the New England colonies. However, people do write a number of books and pamphlets about the empire as a whole. And frequently what they do say is that, look, it's the colonies that rely on enslaved African labor that bring the most wealth, that are the most beneficial to, you know, to England, to the imperial economy, to the defense of the realm overall. Um, oftentimes the New England colonies in particular not only have a bad reputation because of their, you know, sort of religious and, and political uh, reputations that go back decades, but they also aren't, aren't seen as productive, if you will. To a certain degree, it's not quite as pronounced for the Mid-Atlantic or the Chesapeake colonies where there's a clear, particularly the, the Chesapeake colonies, you know, there's a clear, you know, tobacco is, is, you know, quite widespread at that point and a good part of uh, imports coming in from the North American colonies are, you know, coming from the Chesapeake. But New England, those colonies in particular, are uh, are sometimes presented as as a drain on the English imperial system that, you know, we may as well just get rid of or or ignore somehow. They're seen as troublemaking and and not contributing. That's not that's not across the board, but you do see that sometimes. We started this conversation with the same question that Abby posed at the start of her book. And now that Abby has provided us with all this great information, I think we're ready to have her answer it for us. Abby, why did England establish and maintain an empire in the Americas during the 17th and 18th centuries? The million dollar question. Um, I mean, I think, and I'm sure your listeners won't be surprised. I mean, I think the answer has to do with with slavery. Ultimately, it's what makes so many of England's colonies seem productive, seem economically viable, seem economically worthwhile um, to contemporaries. Ultimately, it addressed uh, 
a variety of concerns coming out of England. One of the things I didn't mention earlier is that, you know, with all of these, you know, we talked about indentured servants and voluntary migrants leaving England. After a while, a number of observers in England started to notice that population was actually declining. And it turns out that that's true. England's population dips a little bit during the middle of the 1600s. And so what um, contemporaries, what some of them did was say, hey, I think our co- colonies are to blame for this. You know, we have too many people leaving and going to the Americas or going to Ireland and, you know, places like that. And so in some ways, I see slavery as answering those contemporary concerns. And one of the main things that I try to get across in in my book is that, you know, when scholars have tended to study slavery and the origins of slavery in England's colonies, they tend to do it from a colonial perspective. And we've learned so much from that perspective. We've learned so much about the slave trade itself, how it operated. We've learned so much about how plantations worked. We've learned so much about everyday lives of slaves um, and as well as slave owners and so much important, rich social and economic history. But what hasn't really been emphasized as far as I'm concerned, and again, coming at it as a historian of England, is just how heavily involved the English state or government was in promoting slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. Um, I firmly believe, and you know, one of the main arguments I make in my book is that slavery doesn't take off in the colonies simply because colonists were able to to do this. Um, it's not a colonial accident or what you know some historians have called an unthinking decision. It's it's very much uh, deliberate and it involved heavily. I think uh, you know the actions and decisions and policy coming from London. Um, it's it wasn't it wasn't just going what was going on in the colonies. It, it directly had to do with what was going on in London as well. And there's a uh, sort of relationship between these trends that needs to be recognized. And that's part of what I, you know, hope to have accomplished here in the book. Now that you've answered that million dollar question, I have another one for you in the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. the time war. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. As I read Abby's book and reflected upon my own research of early American history, it seemed to me that the English government lacked the manpower, money, and legal support necessary to force its ideas of empire on the colonies, those ideas being that the colonists should be subordinate to the crown, not the equals of those who lived and ruled in England. Abby, in your opinion, what might have happened if the English government had had the money and manpower to enforce the constitutional changes it wanted Jamaica and other colonies to adopt in the late 17th century? Would the crown have been able to force the colonists to submit to its rule and will? And if so, how would relations between England and her colonies have been different? This is a really interesting question. (laughs) One of the things that... um first popped into my head was I thought, well, there would be a civil war. That's (laughs) that would have been the inevitable result, or at least a a civil war in the colonies, you know, had, as you say, you know, the Royal Navy had the manpower, the will, the money to send a, a small fleet to Jamaica in the late 1670s when the crown is, is trying to, you know, bring Jamaica more closely under its uh, constitutional orbit, what would have happened? I think the Jamaican colonists would have would have rebelled in that instance. Um, and I actually started to think, well, I wonder how far that might have gone. I mean, might there have been an American Revolution earlier and in different and a different part of the Americas? I wonder if there would have been an American Revolution in the 17th century. Caribbean as opposed to 18th century North America. I mean, one of the main, one of the traditional explanations 
for, you know, why the American Revolution doesn't involve or doesn't include Jamaica or Barbados is always, well, they're so heavily dependent on slaves that they need the British government for protection. They need the British government for all of these things that the North American colonists simply didn't didn't need in a similar kind of way. But I actually wonder if, say, you know, that fleet came over from London in the 17th century, if there may, you know, that there may have been instead a successful rebellion. That being said, I'm actually not sure if things might have been different. There still would have probably been a pretty heavy economic dependency between England and colonies, be they or or independent colonies, whatever you know, whichever they they, they would have turned out to be. But it is an interesting it is an interesting question. You know, on the other hand. It's always possible that, you know, the fleet would have arrived, would have subdued the colonies, would have left, and then the colonies would have kept on, or the, you know, the planters and privateers in Jamaica would have kept on doing what they were doing anyway. That's always a distinct possibility as well. So, but it's an interesting thing to think about, and I, and it, it immediately made me think of, well, I wonder how the American Revolution might have been, might have been different down the road. I think we're all going to chew on this question for a bit. And as we do, before we conclude, would you tell us what aspect of history you were researching and writing about now? Sure. My next project has to do with uh, what's called England's financial revolution in the late 17th and early 18th century and how and why it it succeeded. Um, The financial revolution is usually what scholars have labeled England's financial revolution is uh, tended to focus on the institutions involved with that, such as the foundation of the Bank of England in 1694, modern stock exchanges, insurance companies, that sort of thing, um, which are driven by the expansion of credit mechanisms, the creation of the national debt by the English government during the 1690s and early 1700s. One of the things I'm curious about is how and why the financial revolution succeeds. It doesn't really start at a most auspicious time, at least the traditional chronology, you know, having it start in the 1690s amidst these large international wars, constant credit crises, crises in the value of coin, not to mention, you know, the the infamous South Sea bubble of 1720. One of the things I want to explore is how and why people grew comfortable investing in and sort of, uh, you know, believing in, if you will, these new institutions of investment and how and why people placed monetary as well as cultural and political value on these new institutions of investment. And part of that, I think, has to do with the role of popular understandings of of empire may have played in these uh, new investment opportunities. So that's that's what I'm exploring these days. Um, it's still at its you know preliminary stages, but I'm I'm very excited about it. Good luck to you with that project. It certainly sounds very interesting. Thank you. Where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? Well, as you mentioned, I teach in the history department at Texas Tech University, so you can always find me on the website there. Uh, my email is abigail.swingin at ttu.edu. I'm on Twitter. My book has a Facebook page, which anyone can like. If you just search Competing Visions of Empire on Facebook, you will find it. And I'm reachable at any of those, any of those social media outlets. No one will have to look for these pages because we'll provide links in the show notes page for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us and for showing us the competing visions of empire that existed in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. We really enjoyed having you on Ben Franklin's World, Abby. Thank you so much, Liz. It was a lot of fun. I'm grateful that Abby took the time to help us brush up on our English history. Her crash course gave us the context we needed to understand how and why England established colonies. I'm also grateful that she provided so much detail about the types of people who settled in the colonies and why they settled there. Most English men and women went to the colonies to create a better life. But others went because English courts ordered them to. It makes me wonder what those convicts must have thought as they boarded the ships bound for the colonies. Well, I guess being a colonist beats death. 
Although I jest, some of the convicts may have had that thought. The reality was that British colonists living in southern North America or the Caribbean adopted African slave labor as soon as they had the financial means because the subtropical climate of those regions meant death from disease and heat-related illnesses. The desire for slaves and who should control the slave trade, the colonists or the crown through the Royal African Company, highlighted how within a just a few years of settlement, competing visions of empire emerged on both sides of the Atlantic. You can find information about Abby, her book, Competing Visions of Empire, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode. You'll find it all at benfranklinsworld.com slash zero three six. Don't forget to text BF World to three three four four four. That's one word BF World and two threes, three fours to sign up for the Franklin Gazette so you can receive the show notes for next week's episode and every episode after that one right in your inbox. Will you be my Mary Catherine Goddard? You may recall Danielle Allen mentioning her in episode 18 when we discussed the Declaration of Independence. Goddard was the first newspaper printer to publish the Declaration of Independence with a list of all the men who signed it. Goddard helped to spread the word about the Declaration, and I wonder if you would follow in her footsteps by spreading the word about Ben Franklin's world to all your friends, family, teachers, and fellow history lovers. You can feel free to entice them to listen to the show by revealing the names of our guest historians. Finally, it's 4th of July weekend! Happy birthday, United States! How and where will you be celebrating the birth of our nation? Email me a note or a picture to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com or tweet me at Liz Covart. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.